l'auteur de Spin, de Julian, et où plus précisément, de... c'est le roman qui vient de sortir, de Vortex. Donc on va pouvoir parler un, un petit peu de tout ça. Robert Charles Wilson, c'est vraiment... ça fait partie des nouveaux grands auteurs de, de la science-fiction. C'est-à-dire que c'est sans doute un, un des grands noms dont on, dont on se souviendra, parce que simplement, il a des romans assez extraordinaires. Je pense à Spin, mais il y a, il y a tout un tas d'autres romans qui vraiment marque et sont fortement à conseiller. Comme on a eu déjà la chance d'avoir Robert Charles Wilson en France, puisqu'il est venu, sur cette conférence, on va non pas forcément retracer tout son parcours bibliographique, mais on va peut-être discuter un peu des grandes thématiques qu'on trouve dans son œuvre et qui sont en train de se dessiner au fur et à mesure de ses, de ses romans. Simplement, je vais citer quelques, quelques textes, hein, comme « La cabane de l'aiguilleur », qui est son premier texte, son premier roman qui a été sorti en 1986. Il y a aussi « À travers temps », il y a « Darwinia » qu'on va évoquer, il y a « Les chronolites », il y a « Julian », pas mal de choses à, à dire sur « Julian ». Évidemment, « Spin »,« Axis », des Vortex, et puis il y a un roman dont, si on a cinq minutes, j'aimerais bien qu'on parle, c'est Burning Paradise, euh, qu'on n'a pas encore la chance euh, d'avoir euh, en France, mais qui est prévu normalement pour euh, les prochains mois, si je fais bientôt, si je dis pas de bêtises. Mais je, je, si, si je dis pas de bêtises, c'est euh, 2013. Peut-être euh, une, des, une des thématiques qui revient un petit peu dans, dans votre œuvre, c'est celle des, des artefacts extraterrestres, c'est-à-dire que euh, dans différents romans, que ce soit les, les chronolites ou, ou bien encore euh, Spin, euh, voir dans Ange Mémoire, où, où il traque une espèce de pierre extraterrestre, il y a cette idée d'un objet euh, venu d'ailleurs et qui apparaît. Pour quelles raisons et, et qu'est-ce qui vous fascine dans, dans cet objet d'ailleurs Well, I think the answer is, is contained in the word artifact itself. Um, we, uh, Living as we do on this planet, we have experience of animals unlike ourselves. We have experience of uh, uh, the natural world, which is a part of ourselves. Uh, but in terms of artifacts, in terms of made objects, uh, all we have are our own examples. So there's something fascinating about the notion of what something produced by an utterly alien culture or civilization might be like, how comprehensible it might be to us. Uh, which in turn asks the question of how comprehensible would our culture be to one utterly unlike our own. Uh, it, it addresses the question of uh, how much of what we consider reasonable and ordinary actually is reasonable and ordinary and how much of it is simply what we're accustomed to and what we've created in the architecture, the sort of collective architecture of our, uh, our, our own species and civilization. Uh, it's, it's kind of an unanswerable question, which means it's, that makes it a fascinating subject to speculate about. Est-ce qu'on peut dire que l'inconnu est un bon révélateur euh, du caractère des personnages et de l'humanité? Well, it, uh, the unknown, of course, uh, fascinates us for all kinds of reasons, uh, uh, not least because of the light it, it, it uh, casts on, on, on us as a species and as individuals. Um, all of science fiction, in a sense, reaches out into the unknown. One of the, one of the questions we all ask is what, what the world is going to be like in the future, which implies what is the world going to be like without us? What kind of world will we not live to see? It's one of the great unanswerable questions, and science fiction has... One of the things that seduces us into science fiction is the promise uh, of an answer to that, to that unanswerable question. It's, It's one reason I think science fiction has an endless capacity to fascinate. It, it, science fiction doesn't age, it seems to me, the way other literatures age, uh, because we can never really get to the core of what we're talking about. We can only orbit it. We can only approach the, the mystery at the center of science fiction. And, and I love that. Dans Spin, il y a une espèce de, de gang qui entoure euh, la Terre, comme ça, qui apparaît euh, d'un jour à l'autre. Hein. Comment est-ce que vous l'avez imaginé euh, Est-ce que c'est d'abord l'événement qui vous intéressait, vous avez trouvé cette idée-là Ou est-ce que c'est l'idée d'abord qui s'est imposée et ensuite vous avez raconté votre histoire 
Well, uh, you know, it's, there are two questions there. There's, there's a question about that particular idea, and there's a question about how we generate ideas for science fiction. Um, there, there's something interesting to me about the idea of, um, I suppose you could say most generally about the idea of an enclosure. There are enclosed communities in Blind Lake. There's an enclosed community in uh, Mysterium. Uh, it's not an idea that's original to me, but it's one that's always fascinated me. The, the community that's cut off, that's isolated, uh, thrown back on its own resources and put in a new relationship to the exterior world. In Spin, all I did really was to enlarge that concept to, to you know, include the planet itself. Um, it, it also, the, the temporal differential, the, the time difference between what was happening on Earth and in the external universe fascinated me endlessly because it made tangible processes that no individual can, can live to see. Uh, uh, we know that in the geological sense that uh, everything is fluid. Uh, mountains rise, mountains fall, uh, continents move from place to place, but these are all abstractions to us because we can never literally experience them. Um, what pleased me about spin was that it forced people to confront in the span of a single human life, events in the exterior of the universe that would encompass millions or billions of years. Um, and I like to, th those are ideas that, that scientists deal with on a daily, that cosmologists, for instance, and geologists deal with on a daily basis. But I wanted to, to give a sense of that invisible grandeur to the characters in my novel who were just ordinary people who would never, in the course of ordinary events, think about things like that. That was part of the pleasure of writing that book. Et ce qui est intéressant aussi dans, 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 dans Spin, justement, dans, dans cette gang, c'est une espèce de promesse d'apocalypse, mais qui n'est pas pour demain, euh, qui est pour euh, 40 ou 50 ans. Euh, C'est-à-dire qu'on on a encore 40 ou 50 ans euh, à vivre. Vous voyez, c'est cette espèce de, de délai. Pourquoi justement ce, ce délai, cette confrontation euh, à cet apocalypse euh, de plusieurs décennies Well, I, I think it, <laughs> because it gave people more time to worry about it. <laughs> um, it's also the distance at which events begin to seem unreal to people. Um, there's, there was um, a survey that was taken back in the 90s, and I wish I could remember the source of it, because I think it was it's very psychologically informative. Uh, basically, they took a bunch of college students and asked them uh, what the world would be like in, I think it was something like 25 years. Uh, and the answers were, there were a range of answers, but they tended to be fairly spectacular. People talked about a nuclear wasteland, you know, you know robots stalking <laughs> a radioactive wasteland, uh, or the, you know, the uh, uh, effects of global warming, etc. Uh, and the same survey asked the same students how they pictured, what, what they pictured themselves doing in 25 years. And the answers were, well, I'll have a successful career as a lawyer. I'll be a doctor. So there's a huge disconnect in the way we think about the future and the abstract and how we think about it personally. Uh, and that seems to be the, the 40 or 50 year range seems to be when our expectations kind of vanish into fantasy. It's the event horizon of, of the way most people can picture the future. Uh, that's one of the reasons I chose that. Il y a une autre thématique qui est celle d'un peu de la, de la terre inconnue. Hein. Dans, dans plusieurs de vos romans, on découvre soit une autre terre quasiment à découvrir, soit un continent euh, à découvrir. Je pense évidemment à, à Darwinia, par exemple. Qu'est-ce qui vous intéresse avec cette idée de, de terre vierge, de terre à découvrir, à explorer Well, who, who doesn't like a story about an undiscovered wilderness it's, it's, it's one of those basic, attractive literary ideas. Um, I forget what author it was, it may, it may have been Elmore Leonard who said that uh, um, any book that opens with a, a lone horseman uh, at the edge of a, you know, a, a western prairie has got to be a good book. Um, similarly, I think any, any book that opens with a discovery of a virgin wilderness or an unknown planet is, it has a, a, an intuitive attraction for us. Uh, and it was a fun way to kind of reverse the American mythology of the wilderness. Um, literally to, to, to transform Europe into the wilderness, to be explored by Americans or North Americans. Um, 
but also to kind of unpack that idea of what we expect from a new world and, and what it might hold for us. Um, there's, there's a, I think the, the idea of exploring and settling the wilderness invites a kind of optimism from us that's not borne out historically. Um, wildernesses tend to be settled by convicts, by people who are uh, unhappy in their former lives. Uh, they tend to displace uh, uh, native populations who, you know, are somehow... You know, it's a great paradox of American history, the notion of a wilderness that already had people living in it. <laughs> it was, it's, no, it's not undiscovered. <laughs> it's been, you know, populated for thousands of years, but we treat it as the, you know, an unexplored virgin wilderness. So it's a troublesome, strange, and interesting idea, and uh, it was fun to play with. Et justement sur cette thématique de la frontière, est-ce que vous sentez, euh, qui, est, qui est une thématique qu'on retrouve souvent chez, chez des auteurs américains, est-ce que vous vous sentez dans une filiation euh, comme ça, ou, ou au contraire, vous, pas, pas, pas du tout Well, it's interesting, I, uh, I don't know if people know, but I was born in the United States, but I've lived most of my life in Canada, and there's a... There are different ideas of the wilderness between it. There's such similar countries that it's, it's hard to parse the differences between the United States and Canada. But we do have a different idea of the wilderness. Um, the, uh, Margaret Atwood, I think, has written perceptively about the idea of the north in uh, Canada as opposed to the west in the United States. Uh, the west was a place you could go and exploit and find a better life and make a better life for yourself. And in Canada, the north was simply unapproachable. Uh, it was difficult to exploit. It uh, largely was uninhabited in many ways, uh, although, of course, we have, you know, uh, uh, native populations, but it's not a land that supports much in the way of uh, easy living. Um, the wilderness is, is a more threatening idea, I think, for Canadians than it is for Americans. Um, it, you're, you know, it, it uh, invites you to explore different ideas of colonization of, of of uh, imperialism, uh, for instance, and what it means. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, these ideas all seem to me, uh, they just seem to me rich in potential, uh, and that's why I'm drawn to them. Dans, dans ces idées, justement, et, et dans cet inconnu, euh, vous mettez parfois en scène euh, des, des peuples d'ailleurs, des extraterrestres, hein, euh, alors je, je pense à notamment euh, deux cas. Euh, il y a la nouvelle dans l'anthologie des utopiens hein, où euh, effectivement ils ressemblent, ils sont très classiques, hein, puisque c'est une histoire d'enlèvement qui s'intéresse. Et puis je pense évidemment euh, à Spin, avec euh, pas vraiment des extraterrestres, mais des, des humains qui ont évolué différemment. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez nous, nous expliquer justement ce, ce rapport à l'autre dans un autre espace, aux extraterrestres Well, it may just be the concept of the other uh, in general. Um, it, it's sometimes difficult to come to terms with existing in a social community and relating to other people who are like and unlike you. And uh, uh, I have uh, two, two children who were diagnosed with uh, Asperger's syndrome, uh, high-functioning autism, and, uh, which, which involves difficulty in relating to other people. And, uh, uh, there's something fascinating about that distanced perspective. Um, it, there's a, a kind of wisdom that can arise from it. It's not, it is, uh, I don't want to romanticize the idea, uh, but there's a kind of wisdom that arises from the outsider's perspective. Uh, and that, again, I think is one of the virtues of science fiction. Um, the, um, American neurologist Oliver Sacks has written that uh, he's dealt extensively with people with Asperger's syndrome and he, he said famously at one point, he said, science fiction is the national literature of Asperger's syndrome. Uh, because it, it, it so often presents us with the outsider's perspective. Uh, and, and I love the outsider's perspective um, and the truth that can arise from it, uh, which probably says something about me too. Um, but again, it's one of the virtues of science fiction that I keep returning to. Justement, on commence à toucher du doigt sur les raisons qui font que vous écrivez vous, de, de, de la science-fiction. Est-ce que c'est ce rapport à l'humain, ce rapport à l'autre Qu'est-ce qui fait que vous continuez à écrire de la science-fiction 
and are going to carry on writing science fiction in general or that kind of science fiction. Ce genre de science-fiction et de la science-fiction en général. C'est pas anodin, vous pourriez écrire well, du polar ou, ou du western. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, and I've thought about it, and I think most, most writers have thought about it. Um, um, but honestly, no, no. Um, uh, the kind of ideas, the kind of literary ideas I generate fit very nicely in, into science fiction. Uh, science fiction is a genre that I know, I know how it works. Um, as much as I love reading mysteries, I love reading thrillers, I love reading literary fiction, and I have borrowed shamelessly from, from all of those genres, um, which is another virtue of science fiction, is that you can do that. You can do that. It's, it's, uh, it's an inclusive genre. You can borrow from mysteries, and you can borrow from uh, literary fiction. But there's something to me so seductive about science fiction. I came to it at a very early age. I fell in love with it at a very early age. Um, and that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm turning 60 at the end of this year, and that's, that's a great many decades of being in love with a certain kind of literature, so there's, there's obviously something, a deep connection there. There have been times in, uh, in my career when I have drifted away from science fiction. Uh, I used to worry about that. Uh, there would be periods when I wouldn't read it for an extended period of time, and there have been periods when I wrote very slowly or, or not at all. Um, and I used to worry about that, but I, I don't anymore because my experience is that it always comes back. It always comes back. One thing I try to do as a writer is to constantly ask myself what it is that draws me to science fiction. Because if I can identify what I find so hypnotic in that literature, then I can give that back to readers who want the same thing from literature. Um, and, and I think it's one of the most productive questions that writers can ask. I mean, I think a Western writer could ask the same thing. What is it about the Western that draws me to it? And your answers change as you age, too. They become, you know, as, as your knowledge of the world becomes more sophisticated, uh, as you gain experience, your answers change in subtle ways. And as you learn more about writing and more about literature, your answers change. Uh, and that's a, a good thing, I think, for a writer. It, it keeps you from repeating yourself. Uh, it keeps you from going stale. It, uh, it, it keeps you fresh. Um, but uh, as far as uh, uh, writing in other genres, no, I, you know, I haven't even attempted it for, for fun. Really, I'm just having too much fun with science fiction. I, I, uh, uh, my fear is that I'll outlast the genre, actually, <laughs> given the state of publishing in North America. Uh, and given what I've seen over my lifetime of the diffusion of science fiction uh, into the general culture, and the confusion of science fiction with its stage sets and its props uh, is the thing that alarms me a little bit. Uh, we, I think in the popular imagination we're the literature of spaceships, aliens, and ray guns. Um, and there's, there's little consciousness of the thematic material that lurks underneath those props and stage sets. Um, and I think increasingly we have uh, popular culture that caters, caters to the stage sets and the props rather than the thematic material. Uh, we see movies in which uh, there are spaceships because people consider spaceships exciting, not because anyone has given any thought to what a spaceship does or where it goes or how it operates or who's inside it or what it's ultimately for. Uh, and that disturbs me a little bit. Uh, but um, no, for me, it's just, it's just such a rich territory, such a rich and diverse territory. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a playground for, for a writer. And uh, I'm very grateful to have had all the, the time I have had to, to play in it. C'est vrai que c'est ce qu'on voit un petit peu hein, en, en termes de thématiques. On a commencé à lister les thématiques pour préparer la, pré la, la, la table ronde. Il est évident qu'il y a énormément de thématiques. Hein. On, on a parlé euh, de l'inconnu, on a parlé des artefacts extraterrestres. Euh, on va aussi parler, par exemple, euh, du voyage dans le temps. C'est quelque chose qui, qui vous intéresse. Euh, alors c'est pareil, pour quelles raisons Parce que confronter deux périodes, c'est toujours la même chose. Ça permet de les révéler euh, de manière plus forte Well, the, thing that, the thematic thing that underlies all of these uh, ideas, so what I sometimes call a, a meta-theme, uh, 
uh, is, is just the idea of change. Uh, you know, cultural change, political change, scientific change, technological change. Um, it's, it's a central fact of our life, uh, but I'm not sure that we, you know, as evolved animals, we're not, it, it's, I'm not sure we evolved to deal with the kind of change we see on a daily basis in civilization, but we are evolved in such a way that we generate the kind of change we see every day in civilization. Uh, there's an interesting paradox there. Um, the idea of time travel is, is is rich because, again, it, it forces us to consider these things. Uh, it forces us to consider how... It, it, it forces... For, for, to take one example, it forces us to confront the idea of what we would have been had we been born in another time or another place, which goes to the deeper question of how malleable was human personality. Uh, uh, what kind of potential lies inside us? Uh, are we exercising potentials that we could not have exercised a hundred years ago? A hundred years from now, will we be exercising potentials that we can't imagine now? Uh, what a fundamentally human question, and it's not a question that a, a, a dog or a cat could ask, were they capable of asking questions? And the answer would be, we will always be dogs and cats, and we will do what we do. Um, but there's this extraordinary plasticity flexibility of behavior in human beings. Uh, it's the fundamental truth about us. And I think science fiction addresses that in a way that other literatures can't. Alors, on, on, on tourne autour du thème, hein. on tourne autour de, de l'humain, parce que finalement, ce qui vous intéresse, c'est l'humain, et souvent, l'humain relativement modeste face à des événements euh, extraordinaires. C'est vraiment ça qui vous porte dans, dans tous vos livres. Yeah, yeah, that, that and the, uh, that and the knowledge that even the stuff we consider ordinary is in some sense extraordinary, uh, and we're simply uh, not conscious of it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, again, I think it goes down to the outsider's perspective, too. We, we uh, um, fundamentally, I disbelieve in the ordinary. I think all things are extraordinary. Uh, all things are extraordinary. It, a, a visitor from the 13th century would find virtually everything in this room extraordinary, almost incomprehensibly strange, uh, and probably frightening, uh, perhaps beyond comprehension. What a wonderful truth that is about human beings. What an absolutely remarkable truth that is. Uh, I, I have never stopped marveling at it. Uh, I think. The only advantage I have over other writers, or over, over people who don't write science fiction and over other writers, is that I came to this at a very early age. Um, uh, and I don't know why, I don't know why, but, but, but from the time I learned to read, I was fascinated with, yeah, science fiction, in part, but also, you know, when I was, when I was eight years old, I learned that there was a, a meteor crater. We lived in California in those days, and there's a, there's a huge meteor crater called the Behringer Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is, which is not, not that far from California. Um, my family in those days drove back and forth across the country once a year to visit family back east, as we used to say. And that particular summer, I, I harangued my parents. I demanded that they stop so we could see the Behringer Meteor Crater. It was like, you know, a hundred miles out of our way. But they finally relented. I think they got absolutely sick of me going on and on about it. And, uh, and we went to this, this huge hole in the ground. And I think my parents were deeply unimpressed with it. To, to them, I think it really was a circular hole in the ground. Um, but I really, I really couldn't look at it without seeing that impact. Thousands of years old. And the fact that evidence of it still remained. And the fact that it meant it was tangible evidence that we lived in a world where rocks fall from the sky. Thomas Jefferson famously did not believe in the possibility of meteors. Rocks simply don't fall from the sky, he said. How could rocks fall from the sky? Well, rocks do fall from the sky, and it's an astonishing truth. Uh, and uh, for some reason, I think I was quite sensitive to that at a very early age, and I think it's, um, you know, that's, that's one of the few advantages I had as a writer of science fiction was that, for some reason, I came intuitively to that understanding very early. <laughs> <laughs>
Il y, y a un roman qui est, qui est, qui est intéressant parce que, euh, pour le coup, vous approchez un petit peu du pouvoir, c'est Julian. Euh, justement, alors, pour quelles raisons vous avez voulu vous en approcher Puis alors, vous n'avez pas pris Julian qui devient le, le, le président des États-Unis, si on, si on peut dire ça, euh, dans, dans un futur où il est plus dictateur que président. Euh, c'est un de ses proches, son ami intime, qui la raconte. Pourquoi est-ce que vous avez voulu faire ce choix de narration Well, I had been, uh, as part of my research and part of my inspiration for that book, I'd been reading a lot of 19th century American literature, and this is one of the narrative devices that was popular, was to uh, write about some, someone famous and influential from the point of view of a naive friend or observer, uh, and that was part of it. Um, uh, yeah, in some ways, I think it's a, it's a friendlier way to get into a story than to, uh, to deal entirely with the, the great movers and shakers. The other thing I wanted to do in that novel, Julian Comstock, as it's called in the States, um, there, there is this, there, there is what they call the Dominionist movement in the United States, which is literally the idea of, of trying to impose a uh, Christian theocracy, in fact a Protestant Christian theocracy, on the United States politically. And uh, these people have managed to achieve some local successes. But it, it struck me that this was, in its way, an utterly absurd idea. The idea of, of trying to impose theological uniformity on a nation that was founded in theological discord and which has generated endless schism, religious schisms. I mean, Americans love religion, but they also love arguing over religion. Uh, uh, that's why we have these endless generations of Protestant uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, separations and, and uh, sects and uh, uh, people love to define themselves. There's, uh, there's, there's a famous joke which makes sense to Americans about a man who was stranded on, alone on an island for 20 years. Uh, he's finally discovered by a ship and he's showing people what he's, uh, the people arrive on the ship and he says, well, let me show you what I built here. And he takes them to what looks like a little village and he says, you know, this, this is my house that I made. And, uh, Uh, this is uh, the library that I made to uh, house the three books that I salvaged from the shipwrecks. And this is my church. Uh, and the captain of the ship who arrives says, well, what's that building over there? It looks like it's fallen into ruins. And the man says, oh, that. He says, that's the church I used to go to. And so I wanted to, in a sense, what I wanted to do in that book was to give the Dominionists everything they wanted and demonstrate that it actually wouldn't work. It would not work. Um, uh, And it, would, it wouldn't fail from above, it would fail from below. Uh, it would fail from the creativity and uh, impudence. A great 19th century American word. Americans love that word in the 19th century, impudence. Uh, you know, the, the, the virtue of sneering at power, <laughs> essentially. Um, so I wanted to play with those ideas in that book. That's essentially what I was doing. Est-ce que c'est pour ça que finalement on ne voit pas Julian gouverner On ne le voit pas prendre de grandes décisions On, on s'approche encore une fois plus près de son personnage, de son caractère, et quasiment le, le véritable héros, c'est son ami. Oui, il y a quelque chose dans l'intérêt de la futilité du pouvoir aussi. Il y a des choses. In some ways now, Julian strikes me as an Obama-like character in the sense that he came to power but then was sort of powerless to affect the kind of change that he and many others wanted. Um, um, this story is, is partly about Adam, his friend Adam's journey to understanding, uh, or what passes for understanding in uh, uh, Adam's rather naive worldview, but he does actually achieve quite a generous understanding of the world. He comes to terms with Uh, Julian's homosexuality, for instance. Um, he eventually comes to see Julian's relationship with another man as a marriage, which is extraordinary in the social setting of that book. Um, he becomes skeptical of power. Uh, he's, he's the naive character who is not as naive as he seems on the page, uh, which was kind of a fun device to play with, too. Un petit mot sur Julian, euh, puisque pour ceux qui ne l'auraient pas vu, ça se passe dans une Amérique du futur où il n'y a, a plus de pétrole. Hein, euh, et donc on, on 
il y, y a deux questions euh, sous-jacentes. On va parler effectivement d'écologie, de thématique écologique, mais juste avant, euh, on se fait la réflexion sur, quand, on, quand on lit Julian, ça ressemble vraiment quasiment à un 19e siècle. C'était toujours pour ce rapport vis-à-vis -vis du, du dominion Well, yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, there's a sense in which Julian ventured closer to fantasy uh, than anything I've written. Perhaps not fantasy, but I don't know what the word is. Um, uh, it, it, it was not, it's not an extrapolative book. I, I, I don't foresee any real scenario in which America would return to 19th century diction, for instance, which was a big part of the English version of that book. Um, why would they, really? It's a... Uh, um, It's a literary device, and it's a self-conscious literary device, and I'm ordinarily very skeptical of that kind of thing. Uh, it strays into allegory, it strays into self-consciousness. Uh, it can get precious uh, very quickly, precious in the sense of too conscious of itself. Um, but for some reason that story invited that approach for me. Uh, and as a writer you don't turn that, down that kind of invitation. Uh, so, so I, I just I, I went, went with it, and uh, um, you know, I was I was really pleased with the results. Now, it was not my most successful book. It divided its audience a lot. I mean, I have it's been denounced and it's been embraced by people. I, I loved or hated in many ways by people, um, but I I was quite pleased with that book, and I remain quite pleased with that book. At the same time, I'm conscious that it stands out from the rest of my work in a certain way, and probably will continue to stand out in that work, for my work in another way. Oh, and, you know, another invisible influence on that book was, was the novel Cloud Atlas, to tell you the truth. I read uh, uh, David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, and I was so impressed with what he did with voice and genre. I mean, he, he literally duplicated six different kinds of genre in, that, uh, in, in the course of writing the novel Cloud Atlas, and he, his sense of voice was impeccable. Voice in the sense of how the characters speak, or also how the narrative feels, the, the choice of words, um, true to certain times. And, um, It's artificial, it's extraordinarily artificial, but it's also very playful and organic, and I guess that kind of inspired me to write Julian that way too. Uh, but I don't really see myself writing another book like Julian, or if I do, it will surprise me. Le, le rapport justement à ces, à, ces res, à ces ressources naturelles et à ce manque de ressources, euh, ces thématiques presque écologiques, puisqu'on le retrouve aussi dans, dans Vortex, euh, c'est une question qui vous intéresse particulièrement, qui vous inquiète Well, yeah, you know, I think they're really, they're really pressing questions about what, uh, you know, how, how much of humanity the Earth can support. And I've seen different scenarios for how this plays out. I've seen optimistic scenarios, I've seen pessimistic scenarios. Uh, but what interests me in a sense, too, is that none of these, even the most pessimistic of these scenarios, which would envision a vast human dying off, essentially, uh, uh, a really ghastly prospect, uh, mass starvation, an unthinkable prospect, uh, the loss of civilization, again, an unthinkable prospect. But even the worst of these scenarios don't envisage the end of the human species. So there is a human world beyond even the worst scenarios of global warming. Uh, it's, it's not quite the nuclear apocalypse we used to envision in the 1950s and 1960s where we could imagine humanity being wiped from the face of the earth. No, there will be people living on the earth in 200, 300, 400 years. It's just very difficult to envision how they will be living. Um, so that, that interested me too. I mean, these are, real, these are real pressing human problems and I don't have a solution for them. As a science fiction writer, all I can do is Look at them from the front, look at them from the back, look at them from on top. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the service we perform as science fiction writers, is not to, not to solve problems, but to examine them differently. Une des questions qu'on posait tout à l'heure à, à Norman Spinrad, euh, c'était qu'il y a une littérature aussi très engagée, vous avez une littérature d'idées, c'est est-ce que finalement l'écriture c'est possible une forme d'engagement pour vous 
Ce n'est jamais juste un divertissement. Il y a toujours des questions qui se posent. Well, I, you know, I, I was here with, uh, for the interview with Norman Spinrad, so that was rather brilliant. Um, you know, one of the things he said was that there's, there was the perception that science fiction was about the exterior and that literature was about the interior world. Um, uh, that perhaps contemporary literature was too interior and that science fiction was too formally exterior, too, too ideal-oriented. Um, uh, I think that may have been very true at one point. I don't, I don't think it's true any longer. I think there's, there's been a, a complete... Uh, um, you know, the, the ideas have, have merged and it's no longer unacceptable for mainstream authors to work in this, uh, science fiction. We've seen the emergence of authors like David Mitchell, who wrote Cloud Atlas, or, or Michael, uh, how to pronounce it, Michael Chabon, who are utterly comfortable with science fiction and who know science fiction. We, we've always been treated to authors who wrote, mainstream authors who wrote science fiction out of a misunderstanding or an ignorance of what science fiction does and can do. Uh, they usually tried to reinvent the wheel. You know, they, they did clumsily things that we in the genre have painstakingly taught ourselves to do over generations. But this is not true of the current generation of, of young literary writers. They grew up reading science fiction. They know science fiction inside and out. They're not afraid of science fiction. They don't find it demeaning. Um, they don't confine themselves to it in the way that some of my guys do. But, um, but uh, you know, th this is a good development. I think it's a good thing. Uh, Science fiction, I think at its best, is engaged with the world, engaged politically, and engaged uh, uh, philosophically with the world. Uh, but surely this is true of the best literature of any kind. And I think what I was saying earlier about uh, my fear that our genre is becoming defined by its stage sets uh, means that that engagement has been set aside. I... I... I'm not especially attracted to science fiction that does not engage the world intellectually or philosophically or politically. Uh, it's such a useful tool for doing that. It's like, uh, if you don't do that with science fiction, it's, it's like using uh, a saw to hammer a nail. Uh, we have this wonderful capacity to address exactly those issues, and I think we're obliged to use it. On a exploré pas mal de thématiques, pas mal d'idées, on voit que c'est très très riche hein, sur, euh, sur tous vos, vos, vos livres. Comment est-ce que vous, vous travaillez et qu'est-ce qui fait que vous partez dans une direction pour écrire un roman, qui est une idée qui vous accroche Comment est-ce que vous, vous travaillez en tant qu'écrivain um, Do you mean, how do I, you know, what's my, how do I literally work or, or how do I engage the ideas or... Pe Peut-être, oui, plus comment vous partez d'une idée euh, pour euh, arriver jusqu'au roman. I see. Ok, bon, well, c'est un miracle ce qui se passe, pour être honnête. Je pense que je suis comme beaucoup d'autres écrivains de science-fiction, dans le sens que j'ai une collection de collection of loose ideas dans ma tête. Des idées qui peuvent un jour générer un roman et qui n'ont pas encore. Stephen King wrote about this at one point. He said that if you're a writer, it's like having uh, a, a net in your head, and some things pass through and some things don't, and the things that stick are the important things. The things that, they aren't novels, they aren't short stories, but they're pieces that you might eventually assemble into a novel or a short story. And, and since every writer is an, an, a unique individual, we all have different nets in our head that catch different things. Um, The, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, the, the, it's, it's generally an abstraction. I'm, my novels generally begin with an abstraction. Uh, 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 oh, for instance, I wrote a novel called uh, The Harvest, which I think was translated some years ago, and, and it hasn't had a recent edition in France, but it was called The Harvest. Um, it, it's, its origin was in a... Uh, an article I was reading about uh, old growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. I was living in uh, Vancouver on the west coast of Canada at the time. Uh, and what fascinated me was this idea that these, these vast trees, sometimes hundreds of years old, would eventually 
for natural reasons, toppled down, but that the fallen tree was an essential part of the forest ecology, that the fallen tree was a, a birthing place for all kinds of, uh, of new life. It would generate uh, fungal life. It would, uh, uh, as, it, uh, as the uh, fungi broke down the uh, uh, wood into its constituent elements, it would, it would refertilize the soil. It would be a birthing ground for, um, you know, for new, new life of different kinds. Um, and it occurred to, me to, occurred to me to wonder if biologically active planets had their own cycle like that. What if the Earth was, in fact, the equivalent of an old tree? Uh, a biology that had become as complex as it was ever going to get, which was going to die back at some point, but somehow become the source of new life. Not just on the Earth itself, but in what I imagined as a galactic ecology. Um, would the decline of our planet attract sources from outside of the planet that have... You know, actually, I've returned to this idea several times in things I've written, the idea of a galactic ecology. Um, a, a slow, protracted galactic ecology in which the Earth may perhaps even unknowingly plays a role. I think that's a deeply interesting idea. Uh, I've returned to it several times. But to go from there to a novel, you have to ask yourself, what would this mean for human beings? What would it mean for someone like you or me? Uh, how would it play out in a human lifetime? Uh, what are the various ways people could react to this idea? What would it force them to confront? What would it allow them to run away from or escape? Um, those are the questions that a novelist asks. Um, if, if science fiction were purely a literature of ideas, then its main form would be the essay. Um, but no, science fiction is a literature. It asks, it, it demands that we confront the human experience of these ideas. Um, it demands that we imaginatively inhabit these ideas. Uh, so the progress from the idea to the novel is, is, for me, the progress from the abstract to the concrete and from the inhuman to the human. Est-ce qu'il y a des thématiques euh, que vous n'avez pas encore explorées, que vous avez envie d'explorer dans, dans les prochaines années, dans vos prochains romans Well, uh, it's either that or keep repeating myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, I, I've written a novel called uh, Burning Paradise, which, which will be published next year uh, in the States. Um, which began as a, sort of a meditation on insect intelligence. Um, the extraordinary fact that creatures that are individually nearly brainless, uh, termites for instance, can generate real technologies. A termite nest is a complex machine. Uh, termite nests have uh, ventilation, there's uh, the cultivation of fungus takes place within them. Uh, their temperature is regulated, the airflow is regulated. None of this arises from a conscious thought. Um, so the question I was asking myself was, what's the limit? How complex can technology be without a conscious thought? Could a technology in advance of our own arise without conscious thought? Could it interact with us in surprising ways? What about another insect strategy, which is mimicry? Could that kind of intelligence without conscious thought deceive us into believing that it was, you know, could, could such entities deceive us into believing that they were like us? It goes back to the question of uh, what philosophers call the philosophical zombie, the entity with, uh, without any inner experience. No, uh, what philosophers call qualia, no sense of the world, no sense of itself, no self-consciousness, no awareness, but an ability to mimic all those things. Those are interesting questions to me. Uh, the novel, I finished that book, the novel I'm writing now is called uh, uh, The Affinities. Um, it's about... The premise is that uh, technologies arise from our understanding of the human genome, from our understanding of the human brain, from our understanding of what scientists call the connectome, the uh, connections that occur in the human brain, uh, 
from a more profound scientific understanding of how people interact socially. From all of this, there emerges a technology for testing and sorting people. What this means is you can, you can be tested for your membership in what I call affinity groups. There are 22 affinity groups into which maybe 60% of the human population falls into one of these 22 affinity groups. What does it mean to be a member of an affinity group? Well, it doesn't mean you'll be among people who are like you. It would be tedious and awful to be surrounded by people who are like you. But it does mean you'd be surrounded with people who are guaranteed to be compatible with you. People who are guaranteed to be trustworthy. People who will trust you. People from whom you can expect understanding. People who you will be able to understand. People with whom you can interact for those reasons in extraordinarily productive ways. Well, this would pose a whole bunch of problems. Essentially what you've done is invent 22 completely new ethnic groups. What happens if people begin to, since this is such a seductive idea, what happens when people begin to devote their loyalty to it? What happens when your loyalty to your affinity group begins to transcend your loyalty to family, to faith, to culture, to the nation? Uh, what does it mean, for instance, if you're an employer and you want to uh, enhance your business by hiring people exclusively from your affinity group? Are you practicing a form of discrimination? Do you need to address this legally? Uh, what if these affinity groups come into conflict one with another? Uh, what if they begin to practice inter-affinity inter warfare? This seems like it's such an extraordinarily interesting idea. And it casts, I think, a, it, it has the potential to cast a lot of light on how we interact socially. Uh, and that's what I'm working on now. Um, beyond that, I've contracted for a time travel novel called uh, The Last Year, uh, which I'm excited about, too. Uh, the Last Year sounds like an end-of-the-world novel, but in, in fact, it's not. It's, uh, um, the, the premise is that you can travel to the past, but of course, it's, it's an alternate past. The, the premise is, is essentially is that you can travel to alternate worlds, but each alternate world is a little farther away in, in the past. Um, so there are, there are a range of alternate worlds we can travel to that, you know, you... you this, is, this is why I write novels, is because I can't explain these ideas in a few words. <laughs> but the idea is, for instance, that you could travel to, the, uh, to 1890, uh, a world that would be exactly identical to our 1890, up until the point you arrive. Uh, the fact that it's an alternate universe means that you don't have to deal with the question of paradoxes, which I find kind of tedious, the idea of a time paradox. Tedious because so many more talented writers than I have explored them, the idea of death. Um, but it's called the last year because there's a, a period in which uh, this idea is commercially exploited. In other words, someone, someone essentially, a corporation essentially builds a resort in the year 1890. Um, uh, you can go there and visit for a, for a price. Uh, and, of course, this resort has to interact with the world of 1890. You have to be able to organize tours, <laughs> for instance. Um, but but uh, it's called the last year because there's a period of four years in which the, the idea is that you try to conceal from the world where you've arrived as much as possible of our world. Because if you start to educate these people about us, you begin, that, that world begins to diverge from our own simply because of this knowledge. It becomes less attractive as a tourist destination because it isn't the authentic past anymore. But the fifth year, the fifth year is the year when they throw caution to the wind. When they say, don't worry about interacting, don't worry about giving away secrets, go out there and do what you want, say what you want, see what happens. So the last year is the most interesting year. Uh, that's the premise of that book. Uh, beyond that, should I live so long? <laughs> um, I've recently written a short story called Fireborn, which was only meant to be a short story. But I looked at it and thought, you know, this, this, this is a pretty good short story that would make an even better first chapter of a, of a novel. So, so I, I have plans. That's what it amounts to. Le, le, le temps file, c'est très très riche. Est-ce que vous avez des questions Il nous reste euh, moins de 10 minutes, mais euh, c'est l'occasion. <rire>
peut-être sur un roman que vous avez aimé ou une nouvelle de Robert Charles Wilson. N'hésitez pas, c'est le moment. Bon. Ah, monsieur. Le, le, le micro arrive. Alors en fait, j'ai une question parce que je réfléchissais à votre ressourcement thématique, sur l'enfermement et la clôture. Est-ce que dans les romans, nouveaux romans, par exemple Spin ou euh, Vaisseau Voyageur ou Mysterium, la clôture, l'enfermement est une condition nécessaire pour le changement Ah, yeah, well, that, actually, I hadn't thought of it that way, but <laughs> yes, I, I think there's there's some truth to that. Uh, well, anytime anytime people are forced to confront such a situation, it's an opportunity for change. Uh, the, the sensation of being trapped is an invitation to change. Yes, uh, you know. Interestingly, I hadn't thought of it specifically in those terms, but but uh, uh, I guess this is why I come to these events is to learn things about my own work. So, so yes, I, I have nothing. I have nothing more profound to say about it. But yes, that that is an interesting observation. Est-ce que quelqu'un a une autre observation intéressante? <laughs> Fois, deux fois, trois fois. Bon, simplement, peut-être avant de, euh, de vous laisser, il nous reste deux minutes. Euh, le premier roman, c'est 86, enfin un, un certain nombre. Quel regard vous jetez quand vous regardez derrière Quel regard vous jetez sur votre carrière Il y a un concept dans la mathématique qui s'appelle le drunkard's walk. <laughs> which describes a sort of a random path. But uh, I, I, sometimes I think that my career has been a drunkard's walk through science fiction. Um, I, the, the only real evolution I see over the course of my career is, is uh, an increasing grasp of my material and an increasing consciousness of what it is I'm trying to do. Uh, I, when I started writing, I was writing purely intuitively. Uh, my criterion for what to write was, well, what kind of feels interesting to me. And although I still, you know, that, that still is my fundamental criterion, I think as, uh, like any writer, as you go on, you, you develop more insight into what you're doing and a greater, a greater range of skills and uh, uh, a more acute sense of what you're trying to accomplish. What you lose, perhaps, is a certain kind of spontaneity and, uh, and naive love of the work. And I've, I've struggled to kind of cling to that, too. Uh, whether I've succeeded is not for me to judge, I think. On va le laisser. Uh, vous allez pouvoir le retrouver en dédicace, uh, pas tout de suite, mais sans doute demain, pour <laughs> ses romans et notamment Vortex, et puis la nouvelle anthologie des Utopiales. Uh, restez là, car il y a une conférence sur la science-fiction, une machine à réinventer les mythes. Merci Robert Charles Wilson, et merci à vous.